Normally when you're trying to set up shell aliases on your system and you don't have any sort of rule set, what you're going to notice is after the first maybe 10 or 20 of them, it's going to get very difficult to remember what the older aliases were called, what the newer aliases should be called, and it's just going to become sort of a complete mess to maintain. So the way that you go about addressing this is by setting yourself a structured rule set for how all of the aliases on your system should be named. Now, I'm not going to say that my method is the best way of doing it, or anyone else's method is bad, or even that anyone else's method is better than mine. Because everything I'm going to talk about today is entirely based on my opinion and how I like to work and how I remember stuff. And if you don't agree with that, that's fine. Feel free to set up your own method. What I wanted to do today, though, was just give you, I guess, an idea about how you could set up a rule set to do this. And obviously, if you have amazing memory, you don't have to set a rule set whatsoever. You could just name your aliases anything and it doesn't actually matter. But I feel like for most normal people who actually have, you know, trouble remembering stuff sometimes, it will make sense to set up a rule set just to make it a bit easier to remember and a bit easier to use. Now, what I'm going to talk about today is going to be completely shell agnostic. So you could be on PowerShell, you could be on Bash, you could be on ZSH, you could be on Fish. As long as your shell has a concept of what an alias is, it doesn't really matter what shell you're using. I wanted this to be... I guess a general video that would be useful to anyone who frequently uses a shell and I guess really it doesn't necessarily even have to apply to a shell either. The same sort of concepts will hold for Vim aliases or for Emacs aliases or anything else that has a concept of aliases in it. Now the first rule we have, even if you don't consciously think about what you're going to name your aliases, you still probably follow this rule. So for obvious reasons your alias names should be short. Let's say you want to alias the program Ranger. How should this be aliased? Well, you could alias it to be a word that is as long as the name Ranger. But this doesn't really provide much value because at that point, you might as well just type in Ranger because it's the same length anyway. So let's make it a little bit shorter. Let's say it's Ranger, but without the A and without the E. Well, yes, this is still technically shorter and it's still technically an alias, but I feel like there might be a better way to alias that could save you way more key presses than this. Because yes, you will save two key presses. Yes, it is slightly quicker. But instead of doing that, let's make it even shorter than that. Let's say you want to alias it to something like R. Now, this is a much, much shorter alias. It's very easy to remember, especially with something like Ranger, because it's a terminal file manager, you're probably going to be using it fairly frequently. So you're going to start associating the letter R with Ranger. And the connection between the two of them starts to generate very quickly. Now, if you don't want to set it to be a single character, you could set it to be something like R&R. &R. Now, the problem you start to get with those three or four character aliases for a single word is they start to feel like a bit of a code. Yes, you can remember them. I find them a bit more difficult to remember, though, and I try to avoid using them. But if you want to do it that way, then feel free to do so. So the other problem I didn't mention with the longer alias names is they also tend to start getting very difficult to type. The same is definitely true for the code name ones as well, especially when you start using letters that aren't really commonly used. So if you have an alias that has like an X in it or a Z in it, it might get a bit difficult to remember what that alias is and how to actually type it out. As with everything else I'm going to say today, you can get used to doing that, but I try to keep my aliases as short as possible. So going on from that point, when I'm setting my alias names, I try to keep them to one letter per word. So what I mean by this is if I have something like Pandoc, that will be alias to P. Or if I have something like Notify Send, that would be alias to NS. Or Transmission Remote CLI, that would be alias to TRC. Now, this won't produce the shortest aliases possible. I could alias, say, notify send to N, or I could alias transmission remote CLI to T. But the benefit of following my method is they become very, very easy to remember. So as long as you remember the name of the application, so you remember it's called transmission remote CLI. If you know that you're doing one letter per word, well, you know exactly what the alias for that is going to be. It'll be TRC. Or for notify send, you know because it's notify send, the first letter of each word, NS. Notify send, NS. Makes perfect sense. It just makes it very easy to remember what you've actually called the aliases. So even if you do tend to forget them, as long as you know that this rule exists, you're still probably going to be able to guess what you would have named that alias. Now, the other benefit of doing it through this way is it makes it very easy to deal with conflict. So let's say you have transmission remote CLI 
and Tremp. Well, both of them start with a T. So which one should be the one character alias? Should it be the one you use more often? Or should it be based on the length of the actual program name? For me, I go by the length of the program name. Some people might go by the frequency you use the application. I don't really think that makes it as easy to remember, but you might disagree with me on that. We've dealt with programs that have different length names, but what about ones that have the same length? So let's say we have something like git pull and git push. Which one of these should be named GP? Well, for this, I typically will just append an extra letter onto the end of both of them. So on my system, I've got git pushed alias to GPU and git pull alias to GPL. Now, I don't really have a rule set for how this should be done. I kind of just go by the sound of the word and whatever I think really flows the best. So I kind of just think that GPL makes a bit more sense for git pull than GPU would. And then for git push, I think the GPU just feels a bit better than GPS would. I don't know, this is very much based on how I feel about the word. I don't really have a proper way to define a rule for this. It's kind of just a, a feeling, whatever I think just seems like a better choice. When it comes to setting up aliases for programs I don't frequently use, I find it okay to do when my aliases strictly follow my one letter per word rule. So for example, I don't frequently use MPV directly from my terminal. Normally I'll open it up from something like LF, but I've still got an alias for that set to M. Or another one would be for Transmission Remote CLI. Normally when I want to look at this application, I'll open it up directly with a key binding, but I also have an alias for that set to TRC. That's just in case if I ever need to open it up from my terminal, it's still very easy to open up. And because it's strictly following my one letter per word rule, even if I forget what the alias is, because the rule is so simple, it's very easy to derive what I actually set the alias to. Now the next rule we have is about alias groups or alias categories. Now you'll notice this does actually conflict with an earlier rule we talked about, but I still think that it does hold some value. So I don't frequently use this one directly within my shell anymore, mainly I'm using it within LF. So in LF, all of my aliases for moving to a new directory are all prefixed with G. So go to this directory, go to that directory basically. But let's say you want to have some aliases that related to file operations. So you want to have an alias for RM, for move, for touch, and a bunch of other things that all relate to file operations. Now, yes, you could go by the earlier rule we talked about where you would go by the words that are actually in the command. Or you could say all of these are file operation aliases and then give them all the same prefix to say they're all doing the same sort of goal. Now, as I said, I don't frequently use this one in my shell, but from time to time, I still think that it has a bit of value. And the last rule I have is I typically try to avoid aliasing the variations of a command. Now, what I mean by this is I try to avoid aliasing the options of a command. So the problem with doing this is let's say you wanted to alias the options for tar, just a, a kind of extreme example. So you wanted to have stuff for doing bz2, for doing gzip, for doing all of the different things that tar can do. Well, what you'll notice is if you do this for tar, it's probably fine there, but let's say you did it for something else, and for something else, and for something else. What you'll notice is that this starts to snowball very, very quickly. So I try to avoid doing this. Typically, if I'm going to alias for options, it's gonna be for options that I always wanna use for that application. So for example, my ls replacement exa, I've got alias to ls, and I've got a few options on it that I always want to be using. So I'm using the color option, the icons option, and a few others that I want to be using every single time I use that program. So in that case, I think it's perfectly fine to be aliasing options. However, I do make one exception for doing this, and that is with git commands. And you might make the exception for tar, or you might make the exception for some other program. As long as you consciously know which programs you're making exceptions for, I think that it is probably fine and you're going to avoid the snowballing issue. So talking about Git for a moment, with Git, I know which commands I want to be using. I know which commands are useful for me. So I don't go out of my way to alias every single thing that Git can do. So I don't alias things like Git config, or cherry pick, things that I don't frequently use. What I do alias though are things like git push, git diff, git pull, git add, git commit, git status, git clone, things that I know I'm gonna use on a frequent basis and I'm gonna be typing it a ton in my terminal and it's gonna save me a ton of key presses. Now, 
because I know exactly which programs I'm going to be aliasing like this, it's not just going to magically snowball out of control. If I was just doing it with 10, 15, 20 different applications, yes, doing that will just crazily snowball out of control and you just won't remember any of the aliases. And once you stop remembering what the aliases are, they serve no value. So if you don't try to keep control on the aliases that you're actually going to be setting, they start losing their value very, very quickly. Whereas if I just limit it to this very small pool of applications, it's one application, still technically a pool of applications, I don't have the same sort of snowballing problem. So let me know, do you have some sort of structured rule set for setting your alias names? Or maybe you have some sort of implicit rule set that you've never really thought about. Or maybe you're just someone who can manage to remember literally everything that you write in a terminal even though your aliases don't make any sense, you still somehow manage to remember them and they're still somehow useful. Let me know what you do down below and let me know your thoughts. So I think that's pretty much everything for me, but before I go, I want to thank my patrons. So a special thank you to Joachim, Nathan, Andrew, Montazar, Peter D. Rode, Tony Donald, O'Killary and Zilver. If you want to join the Patreon, there'll be a link to that down below, as well as my Amazon affiliate links where you can buy the gear I use in this channel or anything else you want and I'll get a small kickback for it. Also remember to go check out my podcast, that is Tech of a Tea available on library and YouTube, and the audio version is available wherever you listen to audio podcasts. Also remember to go check out this channel, also available on library, BitTube, and also BitChute. And remember to smash the like button and leave me a comment down below, and remember to subscribe and ding the bell icon down below as well. So I think that's pretty much everything for me, and I'm out.